this sideways. I'm never sure. There oh. we go. That well done. So what was all that about then? I don't know. That's a problem that after a year of using Zoom, I have <laughs> never had before. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Rianne, can I introduce Brian? Brian, can Hi. I introduce Rianne? Uh, your nice name... to meet you, Rianne. Uh, nice to meet you. You'll have to tell me all about you. I'm very um, out of touch. Well, it's okay, because I... she can do that for the purposes of the recording. Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll kill two birds with one stone. And I've already wasted 10 minutes of your time. I'm going to try and waste as little no. as possible. It should end no. up being a half hour podcast. Um, okay. But if we talk for longer than that, then that's a very good sign. Thank you uh, okay, so much, Rianne. Much. Thank you, Brian, for um, affording me your time. Well, it's I, a, in my case, it's a pleasure. Well, this this te that technical problem, I've never had that before. It, of course, it had to happen today when I'm recording four different uh, podcasts. The first one went fine. Really? Um, so I don't know what happened here. Anyway, um, first of all, can I just yes. ask you, I, I watched one of your previous podcasts and I'm curious to know what that place is you're in. It looks like something out of Hogwarts. Yes, oh, it is. That's, it that's, is, of course, where I live. Um, <laughs> what is it, it? It is the world's biggest library or one of the world's biggest. I think it's in Frankfurt. Wow. It's definitely in Germany. And oh. um, I, I've actually uh, slightly cheated. The ceiling is from Trinity uh, in Dublin. Trinity the University and oh. uh, the, bo the bookshelf is also not in the world's biggest library featuring as it does my books so that's actually in your room oh no it's a photograph of your room that, that's actually a, a totally photoshopped mock-up which has got uh, my three latest graphic novels and some... you're giving away all the magic here aren't you <laughs> sadly uh, but there's a oh. reason why I've got the green screen rather pretentiously for it which is this is just going to be an audio podcast but that oh. muffles the sound slightly oh, so see. my sound should be less echoey uh, right. What's going to happen is we'll chat for a bit. I'll chat with you both individually. Then we'll look at one person's selection first, then the other person's. I think, Brian, we're going to look at your selection first. Okay. Uh, then Rianne and I will try and guess what it is. I've homed in on a bit of it. Uh, we'll try oh. and guess what it is. Then you'll reveal what it is. And then we'll talk about it or whatever inspires us. And then we'll do the same for Rianne's selection. Okay. And then half an hour later, we should be happy. That would be nice, wouldn't it? OK, I shall begin the recording. Um, I've already started recording, so. Today's recording may include adult themes and strong language. You never know if you're lucky, fingers crossed. Hello and welcome to Comic Cuts, the panel show. My name's Kev F. Sutherland. You might know me as a writer and artist for Beano, Marvel Comics, Oink, Doctor Who, the Scottish Falsetto Sock Puppet Theatre and my graphic novel adaptations of Shakespeare. Although chances are you probably don't. My guests today talking comics are Brian Bolland and Rianne Rollins. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I'm going to do the theme tune now. Brace yourself. This is um, wow. this is unbearable. I sing it live. Comic Cuts. We're looking at a panel and we comprise a panel. There's a few of us. So the panel sees a panel. Then we talk about the comics from the panel we discuss. And we call it Comic Cuts. Be honest. Wow. I can't believe you do that live. I thought it was recorded. Maybe it should be recorded. <laughs> Maybe it should be dispensed with. Both opinions have been voiced. I have two guests with me today who've brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know. Or maybe we'll just show off a bit and have an enjoyable chat. Let us see. I haven't swatted up which part of the country either of you is in. So, Brian, are you somewhere in East Anglia? I'm somewhere in East Anglia, yes. I'm somewhere near Berries and Edmonds in Suffolk, and somewhere near Cambridge, somewhere oh, near. I'm reminded of a, of a little poem which went, uh, as I leave the A427, I come to Bury St Edmunds, not to praise him. Oh. I'm, clearly, I'm clearly the only person who ever That's found quite that. Quite good, poem. quite good. And this is the part of the world you originated in as well, wasn't it? And I originate from Boston in Lincolnshire, and I always have to say that because there is another annoying Boston, a later Boston, in America somewhere. Um, Let's face it, you know, the two... I say I come from Boston, they assume I'm from Massachusetts. 
let's face it, the two are not directly comparable, are they? Not really. There are some sort of historical overlaps, but nothing very much. Yeah, I don't think, unless there's a cheers bar, that there's much in common between Boston Mass and no. Boston Lynx. I think the Mayflower stopped off in, that's the boat, stopped off in Boston on the way to Plymouth and then to Boston or somewhere in America, but there is a connection there. But you're right. Have you ever I don't been know to the... There is a, what? Have you ever been to the top of the Boston stump? Oh, God, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, although it has been closed for many years, because the last time I went, which was decades ago, there are stages. There's once. This is not a vi visual thing. I'm doing a kind of a, <laughs> a mime here. Half, you can go halfway up it now. Uh, you used to be able to go almost to the top. But the last time I tried that, it was full of uh, pigeon shit. So you, you couldn't really. And no lights. So you were walking up there in the dark. But it would have been a great view. Yeah. Do you take uh, unkindly to people suggesting that much of East Anglia is very flat? No, no, it is. Oh, God. I mean, where I come from, it's like a sort of billiard table. It's, it's you could, you know, it's just one straight line for, for a horizon. It's very flat. I live, currently live in Suffolk, which they call flat, but it's quite rolly where I live. But no, I don't mind at all. Big skies. Yes. I mean, to what extent does the place that someone grows up inform their visual sensibilities, do you think? Well, I'll tell you a little story. I was once at a convention, a comic convention in Edinburgh, and I was travelling back by train with Kevin O'Neill and Mick McMahon, some of the others from that era. And we were going through Lincolnshire and um, Kevin looked at the landscape of Lincolnshire and said, no, I can understand why you don't draw backgrounds for it. <laughs> That's grossly unfair, the suggestion that Brian <laughs> Bolland doesn't do backgrounds. Well, I very rarely draw backgrounds. Do you really think that's the case? I honestly had never, that's the thought that had never occurred to me. You, Maybe you distract me from the lack of backgrounds by what's in the You should never reveal your weaknesses. I mean, I can see them all the time, but uh, I've, I've just given away a big one there. But, you know, you, you should never draw attention to, your, to the things you can't do. Now, certainly when you were breaking into comics, London was the magnet. You had to go to London, really, didn't you? Well, I suppose so, yeah, unless you were in... Um, where, where was DC Thompson? Was that Dundee or something? Dundee. You know, very few artists seem to have come from Dundee. No, but, the, I mean, there was a lot of comic art going on up there. I mean, DC Thompson was... Uh, they Was that the Beano and all those? Oh, yeah. Well... Surely you did your very first work for DC Thompson, didn't you? No, I no. Well, actually, if you want to get really down to the nitty gritty, I did my very first work for Oz magazine. No, really? no, I didn't. That's no, no, that's not true. I did my very first work for Time Out magazine. Time Out, together with Oz and friends and some of those sort of sixties underground, seventies, I suppose, underground magazines, um, were all very similar. Time Out was a sort of a an underground rag and I did a little drawing in there and then I moved on to uh, Oz and do you know these these sorts of things international times friends they were kind of uh, well I know them of, from legends I've read about yes. them in the tombs of the <laughs> ancients yeah. but uh, you start all... you started you meant to go on then working with the cool kids the cool kids who are they well, I mean, Time Out magazine, Oz and International Times, uh, very different yeah. from um, if you had started off, say, doing a few mm. random things for DC Thompson or Bunty. Yeah, no, I never drew for the funnies, really. I, I mean, the first professional work I did was for a thing called Power Man, which was published by an, a, an upstart little company from Suffolk, I believe. And they did this... Um, African superhero comic that was sold in Nigeria and I did that for two years 300 pages of that. Uh, so that you, and my, Dave, that was, you and Dave Gibbons and, worked on that? Me and Dave, Dave Gibbons and, and I alternated issues on that yeah so that's that was my first mainstream stuff so I, I and I did a few things for DC Thompson as well because I had an agent the same agent as Dave and he got us a bit of work at DC Thompson and I really can't remember the names of the titles I was in but they were like two page war stories or sort of gothic horror stories and that was before 2000 AD came along. And then of course 2000 AD was the was the big break. I mean did you realise 2000 AD was going to be what it became when you started? No not on? really no I, I, I don't know I, I think they were just trying it out because um, 
the Eagle had contained science fiction uh, through the 50s. Science fiction was a sort of big thing in the 50s, but it fizzled out in the in the 60s. So the, when I first started, there wasn't really a science fiction comic and there was certainly no superhero comics. Um, so when it came along, because Star Wars was the popular thing in 1977, they thought maybe we ought to try a bit of sci-fi. And that's how 2000 AD came along and it was just a tryout, really. They, I don't think they, I mean, how could they look into the future? They, they, they didn't know it was going to be a big deal, did they? Well, if they're going to look into the future, they would have probably given it a title that was set fewer years yes. ahead than 2000 <laughs> AD. It would have been 3000 AD, really, wouldn't it? And you started just by doing covers. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, I suppose so. I did, well, you see, I was still working on Power Man. I was still having to crank out 17 or 15 pages a month or something. So I didn't really have a lot of spare time. And so I was able to do a few covers for, for 2000 AD. They didn't really know what was going to be the main theme or the pulling point of 2000. So they got us to come up with random covers and they would sometimes write a little narrative story to go behind the cover. Um, but then, to, uh, then Judge Dredd became the strong character in the, in the comic and uh, more of us got drawn into that. It was very interesting that uh, the main artists had their own version of Dread. When you went from uh, Mick McMahon to you, uh, everything yes. about him to an extent would change, and Ian Gibson as well. Well, Mick started out, when he first did, uh, when he started out, he was required to, oh, I could tell you this in great detail, I won't bore you with it, but, but um, I think at the beginning he was a fairly untried young artist, and they, uh, I think you'll have to ask him, but... I think they asked him to draw like uh, Carlos Asquera, who created Judge Dredd. Carlos created him, but then stepped aside for some reason. Um, and Mick was required to be a Carlos impersonator, but his own very interesting and distinct style evolved out of that. And, and they were open enough for all of us artists to draw in a slightly different style. And it continues today. It's, a, it's full of all kinds of styles from all, all sorts of influences, isn't it? It is. It, well, would it be right in saying that the amount of detail you put into your drawings means they take a long time to do? Well, well, when I first started, I was, was drawing like a page a day for Power Man and things of that sort. And I knew that if I had to crack a, day, a, a page out every day, it, I'd have to keep it fairly crude. And I knew I could draw better than that, given the time. And by the time I was doing, um, um, you know, things like Judge Death and whatnot, I knew that I could draw it well-ish, you know, to the best of my ability, providing I had more. So I gave, I gave way to my weakness in terms of speed and put in as much time as it required to do the job I knew I could do, even though that meant I couldn't keep up the speed of Mick or Carlos. Carlos was very fast. Were you ever frustrated by how that printing came out? Because I remember there was a short period when 2000 AD, about 1979, was printed in Litho because another comic had been cancelled, I think. And then it went oh. back to the letterpress version again, which oh. uh, made lines a lot less clear. Oh, well, it, I mean, it was it was printed on bog paper wasn't it i mean i yeah. think i mean it was i mean i think all of those comics from up till that period were printed is it are you calling it letterpress I'm yeah not very well up on the, the printing process but it's very crude very rough paper i'm sure it had been recycled from toilet paper or something like that but if you look at them today they're very they've gone very yellow yeah yes that's but right they, they self-destruct I was frustrated by a lot of things. I mean, my own in inability to draw quickly. I'm taking up way too much time. No, but no, no. also the business about, you know, not returning the artwork, that was a big frustration for all of us art artists. How signing, different... signing away all the right, you know, when you got paid, when you're given the check, uh, no, hang on a sec, um, you had to sign a, a document to give up all rights to everything in return for the payment. And that was wow. one of the annoying frustrations of the whole thing. 
Yes, I mean, that had been their ancient practice, hadn't they? Yes. Work for hire. Until yes. uh, 2000 AD, everybody was anonymous, of course. You That's never right. got your artwork back and you got That's no right. royalties and no rights. And I think Kevin, Kevin O'Neill was one of the pioneers of getting us to, I mean, he called us all droids, didn't he? They That's called right. us all, we were all robots. <laughs> and he got away with crediting us by calling us art droid, Holland or McMahon or Gibbons or whatever. So this must, have made, this must have made the temptation of America all the greater because you and uh, Dave spearheaded the American or the British invasion of America about 1980, wasn't it? Uh, uh, 79. Well, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I first did my I, I did my first few covers for uh, DC Comics in 79 and then I suppose 80. Yeah. And then. Uh, DC came. It was DC mainly. DC came over to our. We had a group called the SSI, Society of Strip Illustrators, and some people from DC came over scouting for talent that they'd seen in 2000 AD. Um, and so gradually a sort of um, a rash, I suppose, of British talent started working at, uh, in America. Yeah, I suppose you'd call it the British Invasion. Well, Wikipedia calls it the British invasion. Who well, am I to so argue? It must, be, it, it must be true. And then this led to uh, the high watermark of Killing Joke. Well, it, is Killing Joke a high watermark for you as it is for readers? Um, I, well, it, it is a high watermark for me because it did mark a time when I was able to do the very thing I wanted with the very best writer at the time, who was my friend, Alan Moore. You may have heard of him. Um, so I knew I had to put my best work into it. I've done stuff since then, which I think is a little bit better. Uh, but, but after that, I became, because of my speed, I, I, I'm mainly a cover artist. But I do, do a few, I do do some short stories as well. Stories that you write yourself, of course, like uh, the, the, the Bishop and the Actress. Yes. Of, of fond, I was going to say fond memory, but do you still do Bishop and Actress stories? I, I did one very recently, which went straight onto Facebook. Other platforms are available. <laughs> but I didn't have an immediate, I did it, um, it was a 14 pager, and I'd, um, I tend to come up with these stories because they were in rhyme. And I tend to come up with these stories while I'm mowing the lawn or something like that, you know, while I'm doing some monotonous uh, physical task or other. I suddenly think, hmm, that would work. And I write it all down, and, and um, I, uh, a fourteen-pager uh, uh, um, came into being as a result of one of those occasions. And I, uh, I didn't have a publisher to hand, so I thought, to hell with this! I just want people to see it. It's fun. But I also did Mr. Mamoulian, which was a yes. sort of a slightly more arty kind of stream of consciousness sort of thing, which I was doing for a while in in obscure. Escape published it, and I think some of the Italian um, uh, things like Kimok and uh, Linus, I think they are an Italian um, reprint comic magazine and other places. They are much better, aren't they, in uh, letting artists do creative and left field work and yet selling it in books in Europe than I think we are in this oh, country. Oh, it's a whole different um, dimension in, in France and, and uh, Italy. And others. They have completely different kinds of things. I mean, Mobius, Jean Giraud, his work would be, um, which is wonderful, it was, was all over the, uh, that sort of market, wasn't it? It was. I could talk covers for ages, but Rianne, yeah. you're yes. in the room. Forgive She's me. Here. Yes. Uh, uh, Rianne. Hello, you... what? Now, well, <laughs> Hello, Rianne. Hi. Uh, I have Rianne Rowlands here, and we were talking about credits on artwork. Uh, you're working in the Beano now, and it's only yes. in like the last few years that you lot have been credited, isn't it? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before that, we had to hide our signatures in the artwork somewhere. So now it's nice to see our name on the side. But Brian, I'm just like, I'm in awe. You're my hero anyway. You're amazing. And it's so fascinating oh. to hear you talk. <laughs> well, it's so lovely, to, lovely to meet you. Oh, well, tell me more. You. Tell us more. Well, you both you both have a connection with covers because, Ariane, you did covers for Funeral for a Friend albums. I did. I did. They're a rock band from Wales, which is where I live now. 
I'm from England originally, and I went to university in Cambridge. <laughs> oh. far from you. And I, I love Cambridge, I miss it. Um, but I moved up here to be close to my family. And yeah, if you know, for a friend, they're a band, they were very, very big. They're not quite as big now. Um, but I did their album artwork and that was crazy to walk into like, you know, HMV and see something that you've made on the shelves. And yeah. I've worked for loads of magazines, um, Download Festival, and I've done lots of children's TV work. I love, love well, that. <laughs> the children's TV work was interesting for me because you started doing uh, character design for animation. Okay. So yes. how, how different is that from, from comics work? Do you need to know more about you how figures be... work? Yeah, you've got to be more structured because you have to make sure that they can be animated. So you kind of have to simplify them as much as possible without taking away their character. And you have to know what they look like from every angle. You kind of have to imagine every emotion. So, but then it's not that different from when you're drawing comics because you have to know what your character looks like from every angle. And when you're drawing your comics, you almost pretend you're a camera, you know, like if it's a movie, and you're filming the scene, it's very similar. Well, you were storyboarding for uh, a TV show, which I'll have to pretend I've heard of Chloe's Closet. Uh, was Chloe's yes. Closet uh, really big amongst the kids? It's actually kids TV, wasn't it? It was huge amongst the like two, three year olds <laughs> demographic. Uh, yeah. What's the discipline of storyboarding like? I mean, are you very heavily dictated to or do you have much of a free hand? My, um, the guy who ran our studio was very, very strict. So he would give you thumbnails and say, this is what it's got to look like. Um, but sometimes you got, you in other studios I've worked in, you have total freedom. So it just depends really on, on what studio and, and what script you get. Um, but again, it's knowing camera angles, how the camera is going to pan. Um, you almost have to think like a filmmaker, you know? Mm, and you um, I, it's really heavy, heavy workload. Storyboarding was very heavy. Um, I much prefer comic books to storyboarding. Um, well, it's interesting with the uh, mentioning the, the light of it, because you work in the humorous area. I mean, has your what's the chicken and egg situation? Did your work start off being colourful and fun? And so you chose the places to work in? Or uh, could, is there also a really dark side of you that we just don't get to see at the moment? <laughs> well funnily enough when you see my panel um you'll see that little dark side come out um because uh -huh. I work with I all my work is family friendly um children um and I teach workshops for children um and obviously I draw Ruby for the Beano yes. and she's amazing she's my hero um so yeah everything I do is completely family friendly but there is this side of me like Brian's artwork I absolutely love because I love horror and Ooh. horror is my thing. <laughs> so I love horror movies. I read, all, I've got all Stephen King's collection behind me. And there's that side of me that I never get to explore, um, but I'm hoping to with my own projects now. Um, so you'll see a little bit of that in my, in my choice of panel. <laughs> well, that's to look forward to. And so are a couple of comic panels. Ooh. I have two guests with me who brought a panel from a comic and I've read that bit out all right already. I've asked everyone on the panel to bring a panel to the panel. You can see those images on my website at kevfcomicartist.com and they should be on the artwork for this episode of the podcast depending where you get your podcasts from. But don't worry you shouldn't need to see the images because we are about to describe them and I think we're going to first look at the image that's been brought to the table by Brian. Okay. It's okay I'm about to share it now. Ooh. And um, in order for this to happen, I have to do this. I'm so curious. Okay. Wow. Can you see it, guys? Yes. Is it quite big on your screen? Yes, very big. Okay. So... Right. So we are now looking at the image that Brian's brought. Uh, you shouldn't need to see this because Rianne is about to describe it. What are we looking at? So we're looking at some kind of sci-fi scene. It looks like we may be on another planet. The colours are amazing. We've got blues and purples and yellows and, and bright, bright red, really contrasting colours. We've got three guys who look like they're in spacesuits. And then we've got an awesome big red lava fire monster coming out of the ground. And it says, a great glowing thing, a living lava creature, head for the mole machine. Oh, I, I, I love it. I'm hooked already. I want to know more. And there the, is, I see in the bottom corner, there's a spaceship as well. 
maybe that's the mole machine. We no. could be digging underground, maybe. For the benefit mm. of the panelologists at home who study line colour technique and the like, I can tell you that we're looking at something that's printed with the flat colour of an American comic book. And in fact, just like the flat cover of an American comic book cover from the 1950s, 60s, maybe the 70s, um, th the large voice bubble has got very large lettering on it. And the only time you'd usually get lettering as large as that would be if you were looking at a cover. The three people in space ships uh, space suits are not in distinctive space suits they're not in a costume that certainly i recognize like say the challenges of the unknown or the fantastic four uh, and the line work is not of an artist that i recognize either the big glowing lava creature from this period i'm very familiar with the designs of jack kirby and steve ditko's mm -hmm. monsters on the marvel comics of the time but this is an unfamiliar style <gasps> Rianne, would you like mm -hmm. to have a guess at what comic or type of comic or even name of comic we could be looking at oh it's definitely definitely sci-fi related and I'm guessing it's probably from maybe the 60s or 70s. 1961. Um, I, oh, perfect. And um, what publisher do you think, Rianne? Oh, I'm, I'm thinking an American publisher rather than British. But I, I wouldn't know a name. I, I couldn't even guess. And I've got a slightly unfair advantage because this is a picture cropped in from a front cover. I've Ooh. seen that front cover. And so now I'm going to show the whole front cover to all of us. Can you see it all now? Oh, wow. Oh, I love it. And it's so DC. We realise now that we are looking at a DC comic, Brave and the Bold presents Cave Carson's Adventures Inside Earth. A comic I have not heard of and an artist I still don't recognise. Brian, tell us more. It, uh, it's Bruno Premiani. Um, he, um, he was an Italian. Uh, he was born in 1907 and he had to leave Italy because of the, I think Mussolini, I think actually, and uh, he ended up in Argentina and I think he worked, did a, quite a bit of work in Argentina and when he was in his 50s, he, uh, I don't know whether he actually went and lived in America, but he started at DC Comics drawing Tomahawk which was a sort of, well, it sounds like, doesn't it, like a Western. Um, and f he did a wonderful classics illustrated called The Conquest of Mexico. He was an extremely talented artist. He was very good at horses. He actually produced a, a book all about horses called Cabal, is that? Uh, Cabal, is that Spanish for horse? Um, but he settled in with DC Comics in in the mid in the sort of early to mid sixties, doing drawing Doom Patrol. Have you heard of Doom Patrol? Oh yes, well the TV series, of course. Uh, the TV series. That, yeah. The well, TV series is based on the the more recent remakes of Doom, Doom Patrol in the comics. Yes, that's right. Well, Doom Patrol started off. It was written by Arnold Drake and drawn by Bruno Premiani, who was this guy. And he didn't have an inker. He he drew uh, he penciled and inked the whole thing himself. It was all coloured by other people. Um, uh, and he did the whole of the Doom Patrol series, the original Doom Patrol series from the mid 60s onwards with uh, Elastic Girl and Negative Man and Cliff the Robot Man and various other characters, all of whom are now in a TV series. But the TV series is partly based on uh, Grant Morrison's later versions of Doom Patrol, mm -hmm. which is did, very bonkers. Did the writers get credited at the time that Bruno Primiani was drawing stuff like this in Brave and the Bold? Um, well, actually, the artists weren't really. It was very difficult to know. Most of the time, you couldn't see who the artist was. There were some exceptions. You could Occasionally, you'd see Carmine Infantino signing his name. Alex Toth, who is, I, I was very tempted to include one of his, you know, put up one of his pictures because he's my favourite artist. Um, but we, we somehow always knew who all the artists were, even I think probably through fanzines, even though they didn't get their names put on there. But this guy, Bruno Primiani, if you knew his style, the, the running figures in the foreground, those two running towards the mole machine, it was a very, very Bruno Primiani-esque um, pose they're in there. 
but it's I, a, I, I, I love it. So it's very underrated. Not very many people have heard of it. No, well, that's it. A fascinating part of comics history that has allowed his name to slip through the net as far as getting to me is concerned. The Marvel yeah. artists, of course, were immediately credited right from 1961 yes. from the start of the Marvel comics. And so yeah. uh, there were so many names like Don Heck and Chick Stone, who were yes. uh, possibly minor players compared to Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Steve Ditko. And yet uh, yeah. readers like myself grew up automatically knowing their names and being reminded week after week after week. That's right. Bruno, I mean, Bruno, John, Bruno also John, John Buscema, of course, was one of yes. the big names, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Bruno Primiani, also at the same time as this, uh, or slightly earlier in the 1950s, the EC comics artists, subsequently they became famous to us because they've been written about, they've been celebrated. Everybody yep. talks about Jack Davis and Al yep. Felstein and so on. But yep. uh, Bruno, good Lord, what a dreadful oversight. Well, yes, yes, please take note of the man. He was very good. Uh, find the original Doom Patrols. They're, they're, you know, some people, uh, there was a certain kind of whiz bang and gloss to the people who did the best, um, the, the most popular superheroes, to Jack Kirby and Gil Kane and people like that. They had a kind of gloss about them. Uh, Bruno Premiani's work wasn't quite uh, as flash as. Uh, some of those people who are very, very popular, but technically he was really, really good. Yes. Now, a lot of this work suffers from the colouring. Uh, when you see these things again, would you rather see them recolored? Would you rather see them in black and white? Or do you not mind the colouring of the 50s? I, I, I ask you, mate. Well, I, I, I like, I mean, nowadays when I do work, I do everything in full colour because I have the technical ability here and I do tend to put a lot of modelling and detail in it but I do love the I recently there's another comic called Rip Hunter Time Master from a similar sort of period and I've, I used to have issue number one of that which I can't show you because it's it hasn't been selected but I recently just because I liked it so much did an exact copy of it myself when I say exact copy of it I move bits of it around that hadn't really fit very well on the original and recolored it and I'll, I'll send that to you I've actually seen your redrawing of the Rip Hunter cover, which is oh, fascinating yeah. and yeah. marvellous. Where might somebody find the picture of uh, the Rip Hunter cover that you'd redrawn? The, the original or my, my latest well, one? Well, I've seen the two side by side when you put them up on Facebook. Is that available for the public to see or is it on Instagram? Is it on Twitter? Is it on your website? I do know something. I, I've... I've my, I had a website for a while, but I don't, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Instagram, and I don't have a website these days. I must rectify that as soon as possible, but um, I, I don't know. In, innocent, innocent listener it, at home, if I, if I can, I will remember to put on my website where you can find all of the images from this podcast, uh, the Rip Hunter cover, the original, and then a version that Brian has redrawn purely for your own entertainment. You, did you do that? For my own amusement. I'm retired now, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> And I don't have to worry about getting paid for it. Uh, uh, Rianne, this uh, front cover is a marvellous piece, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. I've never heard of this artist before, so I'm going to go and look at all of his work now and I'm going to check out your Rip Hunter cover as well. But that's Thank why you. I love this podcast, because you learn about new artists that you might have never heard of before. And like you said, their work is so amazing, but they're getting forgotten. So now me and the younger artists that are coming up can be influenced by these incredible artists and then their work won't get forgotten and um, this is stunning I'm so glad you chose to share this well, do you know, a thing that gets reclaimed and reprinted more often than the interiors are the covers uh, mm -hmm. uh, collected books by Tashen Hachet. I think are the publishers who collect up DC front covers. I, I've seen a hundred years of DC front covers also made into postcards and certainly seen widely online. Um, as a result of that, I think Bruno Primiani might be seen by more people uh, in the years to come than for a long time. Good. Yeah, that's great. Now we've just been looking at a bit of flat coloring with yellow doing the job of a rainbow of fire effects. This is a very different second picture that we're about to look at. Can you see that both? I can. We're looking at the panel that's been brought in by Rianne Rowlands. Uh, now, listener at home, you can find this on the website or you should find it on the uh, artwork for this episode of the podcast, but you don't need to because we're about to describe it. 
aren't we, Brian? Yes, I've never seen this before. I've no idea who it, it's by. Am I supposed to guess? I'd like but, you to describe what we're looking at. I've got to describe it. If someone can't see it. Well, it's very uh, can strange I, can I, having, can I, having a, yeah. Can I just say, Brian <laughs> has got his work cut out right now. This is one of the <laughs> hardest panels to try and describe. <laughs> it is, it is. Go for oh, it. Oh, God. I mean, I usually, with when it comes to this work, I tend to think that art speaks for itself. You don't need words when you can draw the picture. I mean, if you... If, <laughs> um, OK, I'll tell you what it looks like. It's... Um, there's a lot... It's, it's a sort of... Um, there's a mad scuffle of beasts all thrashing about in all directions and I'm, I'm describing this quite slowly because I'm discovering bits of it as I look there's something at the top that looks like a crazy chipmunk there's a sort of a, a moose there's another moose with what appears to have a great gash in its neck with its tongue hanging out it's difficult to tell whether it's supposed to be horror or comedy this because there is a sort of comedic, there's a sort of a, there are, two, there are three human beings at the bottom. One of them is a sort of fairly typically sort of heroic, handsome type guy, although he's got white eyes with no pupils in them. And he seems to be trying to strangle an old guy who is smoking a cigar, <laughs> who is going ho, ho, ho. Behind him, there is another fellow who could be a sort of troll or kind of, um, elf and he's he's got a white moustache but all around them are these thrashing beasts that are quite hard to make out whether they are based on real animals or whether they are just animated bits of animals well, for the That's benefit awesome. for the benefit of panelologists, people who study line technique and the like, I would say that this is drawn in a very modern animation style, although it's clearly a comic strip. Uh, you will recognise some of the shapes and proportions from uh, the line work used in Disney and Pixar and other modern animations, especially on the face of our central character. We have in the middle of the uh, bottom centre of the uh, composition we have a uh, heroic figure as described by brian he's wielding a chainsaw he's looking to the right he's surrounded oh, so by so he is I, i've just noticed the chainsaw it's got blood on it if a blood dripping chainsaw uh, there's a figure down on the ground with a cigar in his mouth who i think might be dead because the moose elk raccoons and other forest animals that are diving in from all oh, corners frozen. are <laughs> zombies have i frozen Kev, come just, back, you froze. <laughs> he's frozen. It's just you and me now, isn't it? Let's just talk about him. Oh, this is going to be bad broadband. I've gone. Broadband's cut out. Oh, he's back, I oh, think. <laughs> there's re recording in progress. Um, now, you said that you were, you were a student in Cambridge. What were you doing there? Illustration. In uh, Anglia, Anglia Ruskin, not, not the big posh, um, you no, know, no, super, uh, super no, brainy no, Cambridge. Actually, my, <laughs> our son, who was at Anglia Ruskin about five years ago, doing music uh, technology, uh, creative music technology at Anglia Ruskin. And my wife, as a mature student, did a fine art uh, um, MA there about four years ago. So mm. she may have had some of the same teachers as me. It was yes. such a lovely, lovely school. It's lovely. And yes. of all the three years of education, oh, he's coming back, see? I'm back. Oh, Kevin, Hi, Kev. We were, Kev, we were having such a fascinating conversation without you there. I'm so sorry to cut you off in the middle of your. Uh, That's your all right. That's okay. <laughs> uh, right. I was describing this. Yeah, that was my broadband. If everything that can go wrong today has gone wrong today. Right. We have, descending from the top of the pictures and from all sides, we have what appear to be zombie forest creatures. Yeah, elk. They're zombie creatures, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think I'm ready to guess what comic this might be from. But Brian, would you Ooh. like to have a guess first? Well, I, d I don't know anything about comics, Kev. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I've no idea. It, I will say that I, I do find anime has a big influence on a lot of animation. Uh, the, you know, the Japanese animated films. Uh, and I feel there's an, uh, uh, 
a field, uh, an anime. Is that the way you pronounce the word anime? That's how there I is pronounce a, it. There is that feel to it, but I, I yes, there is. There's off. a lot of there's a lot of cartoon, a lot of Disney esque cartoon to this drawing. The coloring, however, is full modern Photoshop coloring with all I the layer gonna, and depth one gets to yes. comes to expect. I'm going to guess that. I'm going to guess that this could be from something connected to Sam Raimi's um, Dead films, Army of the yes. Dead. Is yes, you it got is? it. It is. You got it. You got it. <laughs> so, Rianne, tell us what exactly this is we're looking at. So this is from Army of Darkness. You're right. Ah. Um, and Ash is our hero in the middle. He's a bit of a, a doofus, really. He's kind of the anti-hero, but you 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 root for him anyway. Um, his hand got infected by the dead. It's like a a book a, a book of the dead that kind of brings zombies and it brings things things back to life, but in like an evil way. And when you said about the humor, that's exactly what it is. It's like slap gore, humor, silliness. And Ash's hand it got infected by the dead, so you have to chop it off. And now he's oh. got the chainsaw instead of the hand. That's why it looks a little bit off, because it is actually his hand. <laughs> I hadn't he, realized that. I can see that now, yeah. Yeah, and his infected hand still kind of chases him and harasses him, and it has a mind of its own. And all of these creatures were just normal animals. And then the, I think it's called the, I've forgotten the name of the book, but the Book of the Dead brings these things in an evil way back to life. So these are dead animals and Ash has got to kind of take them all down. And the comics are just silly, funny, kind of, they're just really nice. I, I say nice in like a, <laughs> not like a, a calming way, but in a funny way. And the reason that I love horror is because of, of all of the types of horror, you get books, you get movies, you get comics, you always get the same thing of being able to face your fears. And I find them quite cathartic in that way because um, you always kind of get strength from facing your fears, if you know what I mean. So when, at the end of a horror movie, when it's finished and you're like, oh, okay, I survived. What have I learned about myself? That kind of feeling. Um, but this artist is Nick Bradshaw. Yeah. He's Nick, a Canadian artist. Nick, Nick Bradshaw. Bradshaw. Nick Bradshaw, Canadian. Yes, now he now does, his style now is very different. He, do, he works for Marvel now. He does Fantastic Four, Spider-Ham, Avengers, Black Panther, Venom. He's been doing that for about 10 years now, I think. Um, but this comic came out in 2004. So his style has really evolved. Really? Um, is, that, is that the whole picture or is there a logo at the top of this? Oh, no, nope. it's a panel. It's a panel. I, I was it's a panel, yep. Cover. Yeah. That and the reason I chose it is because, like your artwork, Brian, it it is yeah. so detailed, and like you said, as you're looking around it, you you just see different things each time. It kind of appears in front of you, and sometimes yeah. these panels are so chaotic that you can't work out what's going on. It takes you a while. You have to go back and look at them again. But I well, yes, I, I was that. I was having that trouble too. As you were asking yeah. me to describe it, I was thinking, oh my god, there's a there's a, another creature in the top left hand corner. I hadn't seen That's that. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I like That's that. That's it. And but the guy this... at the bottom, he is a zombie. You're right. And then the guy in the background is a wise old man for the future who's helping him. Is it's he the... smoking a cigar, by the way? Or is yes. Yeah. He was just a trucker, a normal uh, like a farmer guy with a cigar, and then yeah. the the dead kind of infected him, and then he became a zombie because right. why not <laughs> it's a great testament to the skill of the artist uh, as a compositor as a putting right, together yeah. of what's the word i'm looking for the way when you decide where things should be in the arrangement of yes. the image what's the word i'm looking for composition composition, composition. yes as <laughs> as a compositionist because the eye has to be led around the picture in the right direction doesn't it if all of these creatures were on the same plane it wouldn't work if all the creatures were the same size if they were coming from the same direction it wouldn't work or it would work differently but we see with the lighting that he's used in his coloring but as well as the position of ash's body his arm is up raising his chainsaw then his shoulders slope down leading us down his arm towards the dead prospector lying on the ground um, can i can i just ask one question is this uh, art on in ink on paper is it is it is there actual artwork involved in this before the color goes on do you think yes 
he he pencils everything and then he scans in his pencils and someone else does the coloring. I can get the name for you. Um, but it's all pencil and he does oh. very much like that Disney Pixar feel. It's all very pencilly and then he scans in his pencils, so he doesn't even ink them. But I think now on his newer stuff he does ink, and I think he's digital rather than yeah. traditional. But I think a yeah. lot of us have gone digital now, haven't we? <laughs> Actually, Brian, have you gone digital? I w- I've been digital for 22, 23 years. What, wow. for ev- every stage of and the artwork? Much to the, yes, much to the horror of artwork collectors. Well, is it to your disservice that you haven't got original artwork to sell? Oh, it is, yeah, it's, it's great having, I mean, it's great having original artwork to sell, but um, I love the, um, the things you can do. In, I mean, I do everything in Photoshop. There are so many other bits of software but I mean a manga studio and all kinds of other things that I I can't be asked to learn them actually I know how to <laughs> I, I know how to use Photoshop it's it's even a 10 year old copy of Photoshop you know you're supposed to keep um, updating them but this is a this is a really old version I use yeah you can't go wrong with Photoshop and the nope. colorist is Etienne Saint Laurent so I assume oh. it is that uh, Nick Bradshaw is from Ottawa, which is French Canadian, Canadian, ah. Canada, French Canada. Um, yeah. So I think that may be a French Canadian artist who does the colouring as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's stunning. As a piece of art, I think that is just incredible. I call it ordered chaos. Here's another question. Is this just one panel out of like six or something on the whole page? Yes. So he does an, an average of about six to eight on a page. And that is yeah. one panel. And most of them are as detailed as that. Wow. Yeah. Now, His now work I is will, incredible. I will say that um, too much detail can give you a bit of a headache. I think you've mm-hmm. got to pace it a bit, haven't you? You've got to have a bit of detail next to, you know, something that's a little easy on the eye that you can mm-hmm. scan very quickly and then move on. Yeah, when you read his, definitely. And when you read his stories, they do flow like that. When yeah. the deadites come out and attack, it becomes very chaotic. And then when he's, it's calm again, the panels up do reflect that and the colours reflect it too. You'll have to look yes. at them, you'll, you'll love it. So we're right we're, that, uh, guessing that this is actually a splash panel bigger than yes. most of the panels in the strip. Actually, no, this is on, really? on the page, is about average. Yeah, yeah. Let wow. me just, I'll just, I know you won't be able to see this at home, but if I hold this up to my camera, you can see the full page. Oh, oh my God, I'm, I'm getting a headache already just looking yeah. at it. Wow, it's, then, it, it's a blur of detail. That's, <laughs> that's very, very challenging for the for the reader. But you can see it, how, how satisfying. It's interesting the way, uh, the, the way that zombies have gone full circle as well. Well, not full circle, yeah. they've progressed over the years because um, Army of Darkness comes from um, the Sam Raimi Dead films, which were the original video nasties. Uh, 40 years ago, when Brian was introducing Judge Death, another zombie of sorts, uh, Judge Death was sort of the safe end of zombies and Sam Raimi, video nasties, was getting banned and discussed in, in Parliament. And now this is almost child friendly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, mean, I didn't. I didn't there, leave. I, mean... I didn't leave that open to <laughs> comment. That wasn't the question, I... was it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I mean, are there any Disney zomb- uh, Disney animated zombie films these days? I mean, I haven't seen any Disney. Good, Funnily good enough. question. I mean, no. have they made it into Disney yet? They've They've done the Day yeah. of the Dead in. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. They did what? Sorry. Yeah. What did oh, they do? The, they did the Mexican Day of the Dead. So skeletons and ghosts and all that kind of stuff. But it was done in such a lovely way that it wasn't it wasn't done for scares. It was done for more no. re- remembering your family members. And it was it's such a beautiful film. Definitely watch that. But no, sometimes was that, in, are you talking about the Pixar movie? Yes. Yes. And slightly darker was Tim Burton's Corpse Bride. Uh, which again is a zombie story and actually the Frankenstein Hotel Transylvania uh, films have have taken the stuff which again when they were in universal movies were x-rated films Mm -hmm. and this was the subject matter actually within a decade they become Abbott and Costello films so maybe it doesn't take long before horror loses its edge. Yeah, no. my three-year-old absolutely loves the Hotel Transylvania movies, so that that tells you everything. <laughs> and fifty years ago, I was dancing to the Monster Mash. 
<laughs> you weren't That's around still, 50 years ago. You weren't around 50 years ago, Kev, were you? Really? Oh, whatever happened to my Transylvania twist? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Rianne. Thank you, Brian, for those two amazing suggestions. We have been looking at the cover of Cave Carson from The Brave and the Bold Presents, drawn by Bruno Primiani, selected by Brian. And we've been looking at Nick Bradshaw's artwork from Sam Raimi's Army of Darkness. And if you have any questions about this, you could always try and contact us on our social media. Rianne, where will we find you? I'm on Instagram at Rianne Rollins, and it's R I A double N E Rollins. It's a funny spelling. Blame my mum for that. Oh, you could just Google me, and you'll find me. And I'm in the Beano every week with Ruby. <laughs> Don't forget, Rianne are you, in the Beano. Are, are, you, are you on Facebook, Rianne? Yes, yes. Can, can I find thing, you? Just, oh my God, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And funnily enough, um, I wanted to send you some pictures because my partner is a tattooist, and he's actually tattooed your artwork on people. Oh, right. <laughs> have you seen have you seen tattoos of your artwork before? Yes, and well, Brian wants his pound of flesh. Actually, I, <laughs> yes, I demand those pieces of flesh be cut off and delivered to my house immediately. Uh, yes, I have actually, yes. I, I've seen Joker uh, faces on people's legs, mainly on their legs for some reason. How does and, it feel when you see it? And possibly death as well, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I'd, love see, I'd love to see some pictures of that. Brian, where do we find you on the socials? Well, I'm um, very bad at it at the moment. I'm just on Facebook. Uh, I don't have a website or an Instagram or any of the others, uh, or even a blog. I had one of those, but that became defunct. So I, I'm going to have to rectify that. But you can find me on Facebook, but all of the stuff I put on there is available for people to download and spread about as, as they wish. So you can do that if you like. Or, of course, Judge Dread fans can contact Judge Anderson, as created by Brian, and uh, reach him telepathically. Of that course. was... That was Comic Cuts. Uh, please click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode when it comes out and leave us a review, why don't you? Thanks again to Rianne and to Brian and to you at home for listening. I've been Kev F and this has been Comic Cuts, the panel show. And we're out. Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> oh, thank you I've both. I've never done anything like that before. <laughs> Well, I've never done anything quite so technically inept on my behalf. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't your fault, though. <laughs> I was going to say, what was going wrong, though? With it? I mean, I've, I've done a bit of Zooming, not for a little while, but yeah. uh, it didn't... What, what went wrong? I mean, I... I, 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 I don't I, actually know. And because I've got two more to record today, I'd better find out. I, yeah. Well, I'm not in a hurry, but uh, I've got one at four o'clock, one at seven o'clock, and if we have the same technical problems, that will be uh, a pain, so... Right. Oh, well... Hopefully uh, right. Okay. If this edits up OK, and I'm sure it will, uh, it'll be July, I think, that this will be appearing and I'll let you both know when it does. OK. Yeah, Rianne, what so was much. your last name again, by the way? It's Rollins. 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 Oh, is her okay. name not displaying on your screen? Is it not showing? Uh, Underneath her no, photo? No, I've got your name and I've got my name because I'm probably doing the one talking. When Rianne comes on, I, I think her name... Say something, Rianne. Hello! <laughs> Oh, yeah, there you are. Uh, R Hi. <laughs> R-O-W-L. I shall friend you immediately, if you'll allow me. Thank you, of course. We'll chat. Oh, well, I'm glad <laughs> to have facilitated that. Uh, Brian, yes. are you getting to any festivals? Rianne, are you getting to any festivals this year? No, no. comic festivals or anything like that? No. no. What, what about you, Kev? Are you? Well, I, I'm going to uh, Thought Bubble in Harrogate in November, uh, the Lakes Comic Festival in October, uh, in the Kendall. London Film and in Kendall. Uh, the London Film and Comic Convention is in July, so that will be my first. Uh, but okay. you're not, you're not tempted. Oh, I, I would, too. I would certainly, I would certainly go yeah. give it a chance. Yes, uh, Kevin, too. Kev, have we ever actually met? Uh, we have. I well, I used to run the Bristol one. So 1999 to 2004, it was ah. I who was inviting you down to all these various things. So our, our, a, path, our paths have crossed. Yeah, that was a hell of a long time ago that I was there. I haven't been in Bristol to the Bristol one for ages. No, well, it, 2004 was the last one I ran, and I although was, it was a long time before then, I think. Oh, right. Well, I, I mean, I was always in the UCACs before that. But uh, uh, yes, you're, uh, Brian, you're you revolving. Things. It's revolving yeah. behind you on its own, as if by poltergeist. Well oh, my God. Uh, talking about spooky things, Brian. Books have just flown off my desk here. The, really it was weird. revolving behind you. <laughs> the comics were revolving. And honestly, something flew off. 
Kevin, oh, you're no. still recording? There is a recording of this that should show oh. that. Oh my goodness! That was right. really crazy. <laughs> that was weird. Well, I'm going to have to look into this. <laughs> I, I will let you go to investigate your okay. poltergeist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank bye you bye. both. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Cheers.